Hello everyone and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Lyndall Stout. Ranchers in Woods County are doing their best right now to manage their cattle operations after the massive wildfire that burned nearly 400,000 acres last week in Oklahoma and Kansas. We'll take you there in just a moment. But first, we want to get an update on Oklahoma's winter crops. We begin with our Extension Small Grain Specialist, Jeff Edwards. Overall, the Oklahoma wheat crop is in decent shape right now. Uh, we have gotten a little bit of moisture recently, a, a little bit in northwestern Oklahoma. Uh, that's probably my area of greatest concern right now is northwestern Oklahoma. The drought is slowly creeping back in. As temperatures warm, we get into the 70s and 80s. Our wheat crop uh, really uses a lot of moisture, and that's a very critical time. That's a time when we can lose yield in a hurry and go backwards in a hurry. So from now until about mid-May, we are going to need rainfall, and we are going to need rainfall in a timely manner to go ahead and finish this crop out. So the freezing temperatures we had here in, in mid to late March has had some effect on our wheat crop, uh, especially in southern Oklahoma. It got really cold. There is some freeze injury out there. I've heard of some yellowing wheat associated with freeze injury, but by and large, we escaped with minimal damage. I'm sure you can go out there and find some injury, but as far as overall impact of the crop, not that much injury. And that's the case normally with March freezes. Usually the bark is much worse than the bite. We still have time to produce additional tillers and recover slightly. The real uh, test though will be last week of March, first couple of weeks of April. If we get a freeze into April, we don't bounce back from those. We're still about two weeks ahead of schedule in terms of our wheat crop. Uh, that's really why the freeze event was such a scare for us because we were ahead of schedule. I think the amount of moisture that we had in the soil really helped us out and helped us dodge that bullet. Uh, we, we look to continue to remain ahead of schedule. Uh, of course, it just really depends on temperatures throughout the remainder of the growing season. For the, the last three or four weeks now, uh, diseases have become more prevalent, particularly stripe rust uh, has become more prevalent uh, in southwestern Oklahoma. Across western, as you move up further to the north, it's spotty, but there's hot pockets of it uh, through central Oklahoma and uh, south central Oklahoma. There's two different rusts that can come into Oklahoma, stripe rust and leaf rust. And stripe rust is the rust that usually comes first because it does much better in cooler temperatures. Now we had some early infections infections of stripe rust in this variety here. Uh, we also had very heavy uh, aphid infestations in this trial. And you can see the yellowing in the plot that uh, is partly from the stripe rust, but also due to the heavy aphid infestation. Uh, for the foliar diseases, uh, there's fungicides that can be used. But the fungicides, you want to make sure that you put them on early enough, sufficiently early, that you're protecting the yield and the test weight that you have there. Because a fungicide cannot bring that back. You have to have it on there before the disease gets very severe on the, on the crops. It's been an interesting couple of weeks for Oklahoma crops. And Josh, let's talk about the canola and the cold weather. Well, uh, you know, since the last time we talked about canola, uh, we've had a lot happen. Um, we've gone through those 80 degree days with some nice rainfall and, and what, we, what we have as a result of this is this crop behind us. Um, the crop's looking really good. Um, it's quite a bit ahead of schedule. We're still looking at a couple weeks ahead of schedule uh, for many parts of the state. And uh, what it ended up is us being this far ahead of schedule in, in the freeze this last weekend. Um, and there were quite a few areas of the state that, that were really cold and stayed cold for 20 to 30 hours, um, which, which can do a number on canola. Now, how, how does canola compare to wheat whenever it, whenever it does come to cold weather? Well, since, since canola is considered indeterminate, which means that um, it still has a lot of growth left to it, um, it compared to what you're looking at here, if, if you take a look at this canola plant we have here, mm -hmm. we see that we have just a couple of flowers out, we have all these buds, and we have the potential to even put on more buds. And so this is what we're talking about by this indeterminate nature, which means that essentially that it has more buds than it has on it right now. That way if we froze this entire stalk off, we still have, uh, have potential to still make a crop. Now, uh, the, the, it's, it's flowering right now across Oklahoma. It, 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 is that affecting, or, or excuse me, is that affected by the cold weather? 
It is. The flowers are essentially the most sensitive part, or, or as we're talking right now, they're the sensitive part that we're worrying about. Depending on what, what guys across Oklahoma experienced, a lot of times with these really cold weather that stayed there for a couple of hours, we've probably lost the flowers that were there at that point in time. Um, however, you see this, this, this stalk, if you will, is, is typical of what most guys are probably seeing, is if they came out on Monday or Tuesday, these heads were drooped over and they looked like they were just really miserable. But you see now, it's Thursday, we've had a couple of days of 80, you know, 70, 80 degree weather, it's perked right back up, the stem is nice and firm, you need to look through the stem to make sure that it's not soft. When we start looking at those soft stems, those that's kind of dead tissue, and that's kind of what we're worried about. But we have even the even the top part of the plant is nice and firm. It's it's going to keep going again. Now we have the potential for another freeze this weekend, and this kind of trend is what we don't want to see with canola: is is uh, freezing weather growing again, freezing weather growing again, freezing weather. We don't want to see that with canola. We want to see if we have to go through a freeze at this time of year, one freeze, and then let's get back to growing the crop out. You don't even want to start saying snow or ice storms, but if we can get by without them, we'll be in a good spot. Okay, thank you much. Josh Lofton, Cropping System Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. Soil moisture is critical this time of year. We need enough for wheat and canola to mature, enough for summer crops to get started, and plenty for pasture and hay. On a map of the percent of plant available water from the surface down to 16 inches prior to this week's storms, some very dry sites were scattered across locations west of I-35. East of I-35, soils were wetter. The lowest plant available water in eastern Oklahoma was 76% at the Westville Mesonet site. Soil moisture was very low at Kingfisher at 8%, Freedom at 9%, Eric at 10%, and Weatherford at 11%. A fractional water index map of soil moisture at the 10-inch depth shows why the top 16 inches at those sites came in so low. The 10-inch fractional water index at Kingfisher, Freedom, Eric, and Weatherford was one-tenth. Zero is bone dry. 11 mesonet sites had three-day average four-inch bare soil temperatures creep into the 60s as of Wednesday morning. Warika and Ardmore were the warmest at 62. Here's Gary with the latest on long-term rainfall. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everyone. Well, we have a brand new drought monitor map, and I'm afraid it's not looking good. So let's go right to that map and see what we have. Now the latest map shows an increase in that D1 moderate drought, that's the light tan color, across uh, more of northwest Oklahoma, extending all the way over into uh, Grant County in north central Oklahoma. So that's prime wheat territory, and these are the areas that we're most concerned with over the last few weeks. But we also see an increase in that yellow color, that's the abnormally dry conditions. That's the precursor to drought. Um, but still, this is a, an indication of what we've seen since the beginning of the year increasing dryness across the northwestern half, extending over into northeastern and east central Oklahoma. So we definitely need some rain. Now speaking of rain chances, we do see increased odds of above normal precipitation in the latest April uh, precipitation outlook from the Climate Prediction Center. That's especially true across that western half of the state out into the Panhandle and the surrounding parts. And it extends a little bit over into eastern Oklahoma as well, but not quite as, as, as greatly increased odds. But that would be great news because that's right where we need the rainfall. Now when we look at the monthly drought outlook for April, this is what we might see by the end of April. Uh, unfortunately, most of that drought area across northwest Oklahoma into the Panhandle remains unchanged. Uh, if we do see that increased rain, though, it will be a great start to helping to get rid of that, uh, that drought area as we go through the rest of spring. So 2016, El Nino has been a dud, but we have spring coming up, the bulk of our rainy season. Let's hope we get some rainfall, knock that drought right out of the ballpark. 
That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Wheat prices have been down this last week. Kim, what is going on? Well, the futures markets, you know, they lost about 16 cents uh, on Wednesday. Uh, the basis was down a nickel, so we lost 21 cents on that single day. Mm -hmm. Earlier in the week and late last week, depending on location, we lost another nickel. So we've really lost about 26 cents off the top of this market. And we lost that 26 cents right in front of USDA's reports. What is in that report? Well, if you look at the, uh, the stocks report uh, on wheat, uh, they had the stocks at 1.37 billion bushels. Uh, the analysts were predicting 1.366, so that's right on line there. Shouldn't be much impact, but that is significantly then higher than last year's 1.14 billion. You look at corn, the, the uh, report said 7.81 billion bushels in storage. Uh, analysts had it at 7.82 no impact there and again higher than last year. Uh, pers perspective plantings, mm -hmm. what we're expected to put in the ground, uh, all winter wheat at 49.6 million acres. The analysts thought it would be 51.7. I think that's positive price-wise especially as we look out to harvest uh, but it is uh, nine percent or more less than last year's 54.6. Corn planted acres 93.6 uh, million acres Analysts thought it'd be 90.1, that's big time negative for corn, and 88 uh, million acres last year, so significantly higher. Cotton producers, uh, 9.56 million. Uh, the analysts thought 9.4, so uh, bad news for cotton there, and that's compared to about 8.6 last year. Let's talk about the condition of the crops across Oklahoma right now. Well, if you look at the uh, winter wheat crop, of course, the last couple of weeks, we've been worried about that freeze. The market, uh, essentially no reaction at all to it. Uh, the crop conditions reports uh, come out, uh, dropped 1% on the very, uh, good to very good. So essentially, uh, like we was talking about, a non-event. If you look at this year's condition to last year, we got last, uh, this, uh, last year we had 15% poor to very poor. This year it's 3%. Hmm. Last year we had 44% good to excellent. This year it's 63%. So the crops in Oklahoma, Kansas is about the same, much better than last year. Texas is slightly better than last year, but they had a good crop last year. Let's talk about the, 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 the price potential for this crop. Well, right now we're moving sideways. Uh, the, the information coming in as it is, the good news is we got less acres. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the bad news, and it's not really bad news because we need product to sell, is that it's in good condition. So if we have some wheat, if we can lose it in a foreign market somewhere, then we can, we can get some price increase. If we don't lose the, a foreign crop somewhere, prices are going to stay down in the 4 to $4.50 range as we go uh, into the 2016-17 uh, uh, marketing year. Okay, thank you much. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Those Oklahoma cow-calf producers that have fall calving herds often uh, have a question about when's the best time to wean the calves from those fall cows, those cows that calved last September and October. Should we go ahead and wean them in, in April when the calves are about seven months of age, or should we wait a more traditional time for fall calvers and wait until midsummer, say mid-July, when those calves are about 300 days of age? Well, there's research done here at Oklahoma State University that gives us a good look at the, making that comparison. Dr. Lawman and some of his students about six years ago reported on a four-year data set where they took cows and had half of the herd weaned in mid-April when the calves were about seven months of age. The other half each year were weaned in mid-July. Over a four-year period of time then, they took a look at the rebreeding performance of the cows in that herd, as well as how the calves did in terms of weaning weights. What they found was that there was a significant difference in the rebreeding performance of very young cows if the calves were weaned in April. The difference was about 9%. In the case of mature cows, however, there was no advantage in rebreeding performance whether we weaned in April or waited until July. When you look at the calf weaning weight, 
as you would expect, there's a tremendous difference because the calves are about 90 days older. There was a 204 pound difference in the weaning weights. The calves in April weaning about 438 pounds, whereas the calves in mid-July at 642 pounds. But then comes the question, of course, those calves that were weaned in April, what if we kept them until mid-July? What would they weigh if we just turned them out on native pasture? Those calves in this experiment nearly caught up, not quite. They weighed about an average of 607 pounds at the same weaning date in mid-July. So as I look at this data set, I would come to the conclusion that as we look at some fall calving cows this spring, especially young cows, if they look a little thin to us, we may want to go ahead and wean the calves in April. And in the case of the mature cows, I see no advantage to that early weaning. Leave the calves on the cow until uh, sometime in early, mid-July. 60 days seems to be enough between weaning and uh, the time that they're going to calve next fall for them to regain body condition and be ready to calve in good shape and therefore uh, go ahead and cycle, rebreed during the upcoming breeding season after that. So I think as we look at this data set, there may be different answers to the same question depending upon the age of the cow and the body condition of the cow. But I think this gives you some idea of what to expect if you wean in April or you wean in July with those fall calving cows. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. Sometimes sorting out expiration dates at the grocery store can be a bit of a challenge to help us sort it all out. We're joined by Jim Brooks here at the Food and Ag Product Center. And Jim, let's just talk in general, what do the expiration dates of foods really mean? It's estimated that the average household throws away between $800 and $1,000 of food each year. So you multiply that by the number of families, and that's a significant loss of food that's probably still good but the biggest one that uh, people talk about is used by dates used by dates are a guide that manufacturers go by to where their product is at peak quality it doesn't mean when it hits that date that it's not edible or you can't use it you certainly can but that just means that that was due to their shelf life studies that's about as long as the product was at its peak. This milk, for example, it has a best by date of 12-24-15. And generally speaking, that's good for three or four days even after that date. But the solids in the fat in milk will start to give it that aroma. And you can certainly tell when milk is no longer good. But it doesn't mean that you have to dispose of it if you you know, got one more bowl of cereal to fix. You just have to be smart about the dates and the quality of the product when you use it. The other is a sell-by date. So for the retailer, the grocery store that you shop at, when something gets down to two or three days on it, they want to get rid of it. So they may mark it down and put it in a dump somewhere in the store, uh, two for one or something, and it's still the product's good. And if you buy it and you take it home, put it in the refrigerator, put it in the freezer till you're going to use it, doesn't mean it's bad. It's just, again, at the peak of its quality around that time. And then you have a best use buy. This product is good estimated for probably a year, 18 months. If I haven't used it by then, I probably won't because that tells me that the testing on this put a date on it that it was good, so I'm probably not going to use it. Same thing on the olive oil that we have here. It has the best buy date on it. So oils have a tendency to break down and become a little rancid after that date. So it's kind of like milk. You can smell it, you can taste a little bit of it, and you can tell if it's good or not. So all of those 
factors the used by, the sell by, and best buy are an indication to give you an idea when you buy these products about what you can expect for them. Okay, good advice, Jim Brooks. All Thanks right. a lot. You're welcome. To Woods County now and the tremendous show of support for producers from across Oklahoma. The newest member of the SUNUP team, Curtis Hare, has this part of the story. Time to haul hay. <laughs> in the wake of tragedy and devastation, ranchers from across the state have banded together to provide much needed help to those who have lost so much. On March 28th and 29th, ranchers hauled tons of hay to Ground Zero in Woods County where wildfires have devastated the area. Rancher J.B. Olson came all the way from Newkirk to offer support. Fire station, do you know where you're going? There's a tent right here at the fire station. It makes you feel good to help some people that are, are in bad need of, need some assistance and some hay. It, it burn up, some of them, they burn up all, all their grass and they don't have anything to feed their cattle. Just taking the straps off. Get out and take my straps off. Byron Shirley helped facilitate the donation effort, and he says it came together after he spoke with the Woods County OSU Extension Director. Uh, Greg Heifel called me and he said, Hey, you know, we need to see what we can do about getting some hay, and we need a spot to put it. And then we decided, Hey, let's try to get it straight to the farmer. Uh, instead of piling it at my house i said let's get up into the fire get it to these farmers that are up in there so we've made six to seven different kind of centralized spots you know where the farmers don't have to go too far uh, to travel to get it um, we've got several guys feeding out of each stack so hopefully we're doing it the right way i don't know byron who himself lost 10 cows and three donkeys in the fire, says it was imperative to get hay to the area as soon as possible, and the donations will be invaluable. This will help a tremendous amount because they're not gonna have to go, you know, some of these guys have never bought hay. They don't even, they raise it themselves. They've never, they don't even know where to go get it. OSU's Division of Agricultural Science and Natural Resources also lended a helping hand and donated nearly 50 round bells to the effort. Well, I guess we saw the story about the fires and the devastation that it was causing, and we really saw the opportunity, I guess, to, to kind of just illustrate the Oklahoma standard, you know, people really helping to take care of other people in need. And I think along with that, we really saw an opportunity to pay it forward. We've been the beneficiary of the gift of these trucks from Mr. John Groendyke with Groendyke Trucking out of Enid, and we use these trucks. We just got them about a few weeks ago, and we use these trucks to move hay and equipment across the state. And we just saw the opportunity to take some excess production, uh, some hay that we had produced down at uh, Chickasha, and make a donation that we thought that would really uh, help the farmers and growers in that region. The donations of hay are gonna be a tremendous help for the ranchers here in Woods County. But with miles and miles of fence lost, as well as nearly 500 head of cattle, the road to recovery is gonna be a long one. You know, one farmer lost 20 miles. And it's going to take several crews, several weeks to go through all that fence. Um, the farmers are going every day, the ones that I know of, and going through their fences, but it's, it, you know, there's just miles and miles of it. For JB, it's not a special act of generosity or any kind of heroics. It's just what you do. It's just a rural way to do it. If you, if you can help somebody, you help them. It don't matter if you know them or not. Joining us now is our County Extension Director here in Woods County, Greg Heifel. And Greg, what a tremendous outpouring of support from people all across Oklahoma. Isn't that correct? We've got uh, hay being donated from all parts of, of Oklahoma. I've received calls from all over the state. Uh, we've already received uh, 30 loads of hay uh, and there's more on the way. So uh, 
you know, a thousand tons of hay being brought here to Woods County to replace this devastation is very impressive. Woods County ranchers do a great job of adapting to the, the times and, uh, and they will to this. Uh, in 30 days, this will look totally different. The grass will green up and, and we'll have a nice green up, but there'll still be so much to do and we need to still continue to remember them and the struggles they're having. Uh, and at the same time, we know that uh, we're gonna get through this and work through all of our issues and, and even have a greater future. How good would it be to get an inch or two of rain right now? <laughs> well, Rain would be wonderful. Uh, we, we desperately need a rain. We've got decent sub moisture, so I expect a good green up initially here, uh, but without some rain, we're, we're just going to be starved for forage uh, for the entire summer, and that'll be a tremendous challenge. There's just so many pastures in Woods County right now that we can't utilize uh, because of the fencing situation. So lots to be done. Uh, lots of cows will be scattered. Uh, across other areas and then come back to Woods County when we're ready to, to have them. Well, we wish you and, and everyone in Woods County the best of luck. Keep us posted and, uh, and good luck with everything. Well, we'll sure do that. Okay, thank you, Greg. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime online at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time at Sunup.